We're live. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to this meeting of the current Mahone Bay Town Council. Glad to see that everyone is here this evening. And that, uh, we have an audience with us as well, some citizens watching on YouTube. And at the end of the meeting tonight, there will be an opportunity if there are any questions for citizens, then we would receive and respond to those questions. I'm, I'm Mr. Hyde, please. I am just having some audio issues, Dave. I, I think unless I'm the only one experiencing it. Um, on your end, which is not something we've ever had with your feed before, but I just wanted to let you know. I'm not sure if there's anything you can do about it. Uh, okay. I've, I've got a new um, laptop here and I'm still dealing with it. Let's put it that way. Well, thanks for troubleshooting them because I guess all the new council members are going to have to have them. Yeah, so right. <laughs> Having a great time. My my Apple stuff, I can't for some reason is not working tonight. So anyway, that's here or there. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order at uh, seven o two. You have an agenda that was mailed out <clears throat> to you. Any additions to the agenda, or can we have a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved by Councillor Carver, seconded by Councillor Now. All in favor? Motion's carried. Let's go to the minutes of the last meeting. What is the wish of Council? Would they be approved to circulate your worship? We have a seconder, Councillor Bain. Uh, motion to receive or, or to uh, approve as, circ as circulated. All in favor? Motions carried. I think we have minutes from a special meeting, do we not? I don't have the agenda right in front of me because this is on the screen, obviously. I move they be accepted as uh, circulated. You, do we have a seconder? Councillor Feeney moved and seconded to accept the special meeting minutes as presented. All in favor? The motions carried. Uh, let's go to item number, uh, the first item on the agenda. Mr. Hyde, can you put the agenda on the screen, please? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I say that, but uh, need participant sharing enabled. Uh, one of you, Kelly. Should yeah. be fine now. Yep, yeah, thank you. It uh, should be up there. Uh, e excellent. Thank you. Uh, so the minutes of the two meetings, we have no delegations or individuals who are going to address council. We have no correspondence action items. We have three information items in our correspondence log. What is the wish of council? Motion to receive and file the correspondence. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and seconded by second. O'Neill. All in favor? Motion's carried. Let's move on to staff reports. Ever present staff reports to council. And I'll just uh, note, as always, we'll take questions, but the only part of the report that's updated on the first meeting of each month is just this very first section on council assignments to staff. Yes. Anyone have any comments or questions concerning that first portion of this document? Councillor Feeney. Mayor, uh, item six, um, the expected arrival of some um, corroborating information from TIR. Uh, I think that was on an earlier agenda um, with the expectation that tonight there'd be delivered. I'm, I'm just assuming um, that, that is, that's just the work in progress and that will come down the train track here either 
November 10th or at some other date, you know, be between now and Christmas, maybe. Yeah, that, that's certainly the reason. Um, th so this one and uh, two other pieces, the um, NSLC and uh, status of funding for the um, Department of Energy um, Connect2 application that we submitted are kind of all tied up together. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do expect that even though there won't be an opportunity for a staff report in October, that there will be an update to council later in October um, based on the status of Connect 2. And then that should kind of move everything along. Um, I will note that I, I would not be surprised if we end up uh, having to have a conversation at that time about prioritizing parts of the council's transportation project to move ahead this fall. And uh, I think councillors should expect that there may still be a conversation about what we can accomplish this fall based on the funding levels. But uh, I'll, I'll certainly send that out by email as soon as I do have anything new. I, I think Mary, that I think that sounds that sounds that sounds fine. Um, I guess no real shock. The the one non-financial element of the transportation study that a council sort of wants to see uh, move along is. The Cherry Street one-way street application. Um, I think that some of the community members that live on Cherry Lane are, uh, you know, have an expectation that that might be something that happens in 2020. And if, if for whatever reason we can't get, um, we're not able to uh, meet that kind of timeline, I do think it's, it, it's worth our while just to communicate that back to the folks who live there that, um, you know, council, I'm sure this council and and the next council will probably be, you know, supporting that. It just we just may not be able to deliver on timelines based on something that we can't control. Speaking of that, the the Cherry Lane one way thing, CAO, uh, are we are we talking about a couple of one way signs and a no left turn? Or yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of been across the board The you know, we, we went to CVCL and asked for professional estimates on all of these different components to apply for external funding. Um, at, at the end of the day, I do think that even with having gone over these estimates with their estimator and with Derek and myself, that some of them are a bit high. And, you know, part of prioritizing them may be what we can do within our own budget. But I also think there's just an element of which ones can move ahead it, with with speed. So that is when where we know, um, you know, relatively speaking, what needs to be done with it. Uh, I think that the you know time of year is uh, is more of a factor for some of the other components. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you know, I, I think we'll just have to see what happens. But I, I, I do believe that reasonably that Cherry Lane project will be able to move ahead this fall. And there, just just uh, yeah. one more brief, couple more brief questions under under service stats and the bylaw enforcement item. I'm wondering, um, and I know we really can't speak to it um, directly here, Mo, but uh, you know, I think there is an issue around around. Um, I'm hearing more through the grapevine about the containers. I think we're up to four containers in town, and that might be just something that we could come back to. Um, either directly by email or put that back on the agenda to talk about bylaw enforcement in that area at a later date for either this or a future council. I think that's, uh, I think everybody's well aware of that issue at this point. Difficult to discuss right now, yeah. um, but um, I can say that um, the uh, uh, enforcement professionals involved are involved. Fair enough. And by the time of the next update to the section of the report, which, yeah, because of the election, there's a bit of a gap there from September 24th to November 26th, but I expect we'll have a little bit more to add at that time, what we can add publicly. I'm going Thanks. to go back to Cherry Lane. Yeah. Uh, we, we approved that some time ago. I don't see it as a big ticket item. I really don't know why the process is bogged down for two or three signs. And uh, the people were very enthusiastic with uh, the decision that was made by council. That was many months ago now. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm just questioning why we aren't able to uh, move these things ahead very quickly. I don't see signs as being a lot of money, even if they're 
temporary waiting for the, the Cadillacs. Uh, I just don't quite understand the delays like that. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you know, as I was saying to Councillor Feeney, the delay is because Council directed us to apply for external funding. So the Connect 2 program provides up to 75% funding and our total transportation projects this year were 158,000, I believe. So, you know, we're looking at about $100,000 of, of external funding there. Um, we can take off pieces of that. So, you know, for example, if this if this piece um, represents, you know, $8,000 say, and I know it's a couple of sides, it doesn't seem like much, but let's just say based on the professional estimate, I believe that that's kind of what we're looking at, then we're taking off the 75% or $6,000 that would have been would have been applied to that. So, you know, council can, and, and I think maybe will want to make that decision as we move into the fall. I expect we'll have word from the Connect2 program within the month. I know that they really do want people to be able to action these projects here, and they do understand what that means in terms of winter. Um, but I but I will, you know, I do understand uh, council will not want to see these projects just stalled for this fall. And that's one that I think we can move forward on quickly. Uh, so take your point, uh, Councillor Bain. Any other comments or questions? Uh, are you speaking to me, Mayor DeBenny? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your picture, Councillor Carver. Oh, oh, yes, okay, so I have a question, may I? I'm blocking it out. If I, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. Okay, can I, can I have a turn now? You certainly can. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I do have a question about the Director of Operations section, 6.1, and the first item in that section that, that refers to the um, roadside and shoulder mowing. So it, it's the first time I've noticed that particular item in this report. Um, and it just led me to wonder what is the regime that they have for mowing roadsides and shoulder shoulders is how frequent is it and what to what extent what does it include what roads uh well it's a it's a broad question i mean they do maintenance as required so some streets admittedly back streets they're not on them as much, uh, you know, it, there are three different factors, I suppose there's, you know, traffic flow, um, occasionally vegetation's an issue. <laughs> there's much more likely water um, runoff issues and ditch issues. And then there's the aesthetics. Uh, you know, I think most of the time, the streets that require a lot of roadside vegetation maintenance are places where there are roadside ditches or, or otherwise um, above ground stormwater drainage. Um, and then, you know, that doesn't happen to be areas that are necessarily the most aesthetic. So you get somewhere like Edgewater Street, which has both. Uh, and, you know, they, they may be down there more often. Long Hill Road um, has a lot of roadside ditches uh, or Kinburn, but they're not, you know, aesthetically as noticeable. Um, so I, there's a lot of different factors. Obviously, also in the course of a summer, different summers, there's different amounts of rainfall. Um, so they do them as needed would be the simple answer. Um, but I, you know, I can certainly, I think it's worth in the future in our asset management um, conversations, you know, I invite Derek to have a broader conversation on that subject. And if you're interested, whether or not you're on that committee, um, you know, I'm sure we will get there. Uh, I don't believe we have a published standard in terms of roadside maintenance at the current time, uh, but that is something that we may want to consider. Um, I, I'm asking partly because it's something that I've noticed personally uh, over the years and just recently in conversations with community members, the, the issue has come up a, a few times, people noticing uh, mainly the aesthetics, um, although I certainly appreciate the, the functional issues, but it, it's the aesthetics that people uh, have spoken to me about. Um, so I'm just putting that out there and wondering if that is something that could be um, noted. Yeah, we did have some complaints and I'm glad that uh, Derek was able to, to 
respond and do that, particularly along uh, Edgewater and coming into town. And uh, yes, Councillor Carver, it was all ascetic. It wasn't uh, for for other technical reasons. It was just strictly for uh, appearance of the yeah. entrance to the town. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's really important for the town to, that the, we put our best foot forward when we can. I, I echo those sentiments, uh, Councillor Carver. I have addressed the issue at least three summers in a row for staff uh, about mowing the strip in particular Edgewater Street. The other piece that I find uh, difficult is up Clearway Street beside the cemetery. We're talking about improving the fencing, the look of the fencing around the cemetery, and you've got this jungle of growth in the ditch going up beside the cemetery. And frankly, it looks like it's terrible looking. Edgewater Street, it is aesthetics. CAO, but it's also a safety hazard because you often cannot see beyond the tall grass on Edgewater Street. We've discussed over the last few years of something like a sickle mower that goes on the side of the town's tractor to facilitate keeping those grasses mowed. But unfortunately, it's never found its way into the work for the period. And perhaps for the fiscal year uh, one, two, we can do just that. Find a way to, to embrace the technology to allow us to easily keep those ditches aesthetically more pleasing, but also more functional. So I leave that to the CAO and and his staff to, to find a way. And to be sure that when we do our operations budget in uh, March, hopefully, that'll be one of the items on the list. Yeah, I'll certainly talk to our director of operations about that. Your yeah. worship? Yes, sir. We do have a sickle mower here. A burr that goes on the side of the tractor? Yeah. Would that facilitate keeping those ditches mowed? It's not really going to mow the ditches. It might mow the top on the curb, but it's yes. not going to mow the ditches because they okay. it's a straight blade, but it would cut down along the roadway. Okay. But if you want to do the ditches, you're going to have to use that whipper snipper or something like that. But okay. Yep. We already Thank have you. so don't buy another one. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. He knows everything. Okay, anything else for the CAO on this one? Okay. Hearing nothing, let's go on to the next piece. Staff report to council on the green bin collection. Worship staff were directed at the last council meeting to look into green bin collection and come back with any numbers associated with the different options. I will point out there is a typo in the staff recommendation um, to council. The staff recommendation in the actual recommendation section refers to collection July through August. It is um, as is noted other places in that report that is actually June through August. So I don't know if anybody has any questions for me. Deputy Mayor, you're on mute, sir. Uh, Your Worship, I've moved the council direct staff to send uh, Mr. Frank the correspondence advising that the weekly green bins collected will remain as scheduled for the months of June through August inclusive and further that staff will include information about green bins alternative for uh, collection of yard waste. Second that. 
Second Ed Counselor now? Yes. On the motion, question? All in favor? Motion is carried, thank you. Let's go to the next item on the agenda, which is the staff report to council on the solar connectivity policy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this one is um, a policy. So it was originally presented to council at your last meeting, uh, September 24th. At that time, there was a bit of discussion uh, on the part of council wanting to see um, the two alternative wordings that were discussed presented here. And so that's what I've added. Uh, it's a small change. So there's essentially two wordings here up for consideration. Um, in one case reads, excess power generated in a given period will be credited toward usage in future periods. And the other says excess power generated in a given period will not be credited toward uses in future periods. And uh, I'm looking for um, council to uh, provide direction to staff in terms of the application of this policy by uh, providing a motion here to uh, amend the policy uh, using one of the words, word, <laughs> wording choices presented. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Yes. Um, Mayor, I would like to move um, that, um, I would like to make the former motion um, and uh, that there will be a compensation for excess, um, that excess power generated in a given period will be credited toward usage in future periods. Thank you, we have a second. Carver is Seconded. I'll second it there. Couldn't Thank find you, my Councillor Carver. Uh, so the motion is that excess power generated in a given period will be credited towards usage in future periods. The CAO is is that in immediately successive periods necessarily, or is it that at some future date or? <clears throat> Uh, so this is modeled on what's done in Berwick and Anaganish, which just essentially is a rolling credit. So at the end of a month, if power produced exceeds power consumed, then a credit is tracked on the next month. If power produced uh, doesn't, doesn't exceed power consumed, then the previous month's credit will be applied before purchasing power to make up the difference. And then uh, in the event that the power again exceeds power consumed, uh, then that credit will will again carry forward. So it, it is possible in the case of solar that if there are a number of good months, uh, credit can be built up um, over several months. And I guess when I keep saying months, I, I should point out we have a bi-monthly billing. So it's, it's actually every two months. So the, the credit that one achieves by generating more than one uses rolls and accumulates to some future period when ostensibly you would use more than you would have generated. Yeah, and the policy prohibits paying out that credit amount. So if you don't have months in which you underproduce, then you, you're not uh, actually compensated. That's prohibited by the policy under the board. May I speak to why I made the motion, Mayor? Yes, please. I can't see thank you, you. O'Neill, but okay. <laughs> I hear you. Um, great. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so, uh, so this is um, one of those moments where I'm I'm very happy. There's been many, but there are. This is one of those very clear moments where I am very happy to be sitting at this council table to be able to discuss this uh, this question because I think that it is a question that is very important for Mahone Bay and for the future of Mahone Bay. And I think that we're probably in a moment going to be hearing a counter argument for why we should not uh, be allowing this. And that counter argument is going to run along the lines of um, crediting back um, uh, in this manner undermines the value proposition for the Mahone Bay utility. 
so that if we would not, uh, if we would credit back um, excess electricity uh, that is generated that uh, takes away from the greater uh, whole uh, um, and, and other residents. Um, and, and I would have to um, concede that it, uh, that it does. However, I think the level at which it would um, has been greatly overestimated by the amount that it actually would. So I think that um, just in terms of the the value that we uh, the values we're talking about, um, the amount of the credit will not be felt in any significant way by any of the other customers of the Mahone Bay utility. But it will be felt, in a disproportionately negative way by those very concerned and engaged citizens who invest in their own rooftop solar installations. And why I am arguing for this position in particular is that in um, 2019 and February 12th, 2019 specifically, this council, these exact people sitting at this table declared a climate emergency. Every single person here, it was a unanimous vote. We declared that the town of Mahone Bay is in a climate emergency. And why I think that's important for this discussion is that that's one of those moments where you have to actually take a position on what you believe in, right? So if you say that you are in a climate emergency, that should actually make certain decisions that happen later down the road far easier than they other would, otherwise would be. You would, for example, if you are offering, if you have a choice between making it easier for people to put rooftop solar on versus more difficult to put rooftop solar on, you might ask yourself, hey, have we declared a climate emergency that could lend some guidance to this question? What would a town that has declared a climate emergency do in this exact situation? Are we going to treat the planet and the imperative we have to address climate change, are we gonna treat the planet as an externality to the calculation that we're gonna make? Or are we gonna factor in the fact that we're in a global climate crisis into this decision? We get to ask that. And we, we actually do because we all decided there was a climate emergency. So I tried to explain this to my son today, he's 11. And I said to him, so we have this decision that we have to make in Mahone Bay. And, you know, there's some people who want to, you know, help the climate and, you know, we're already doing really well because, you know, we're sort of at 97% for, you know, renewable energy in this town. And that's already amazing, right? We are doing so much better than a lot of places. So, but what the decision is that we have to make tonight is like some people, you know, they want to put solar on their own rooftops. They want to be part of the uh, future, um, they want to be making 21st century decisions for their families and they want to um, put up solar, but it's super expensive. So, um, so we have a choice as to whether the extra electricity that they generate is going to be given, uh, sold to other people. And then when that person needs electricity, you've got to buy back your own electricity. And my 11 year old, thinks that that is not fair, that that is, he didn't use the word patently unfair, but is, uh, that's the word that I use. I feel like that that would be the kind of decision that would be unfair. So I know that this has been really long-winded, but I'm clearly very passionate about this. I feel there's one correct decision to make here. And I feel like there is a regressive decision to make here. And I would like to make a progressive decision on this point that will not in fact cost the residents of Mahone Bay much relative to, um, uh, relative to uh, the option. And I would respectfully um, just open the floor to more conversation, um, but I would like to call a recorded vote on, my, on this motion. Thank you. Okay, recorded vote. Comments? Mayor, I'll just take an opportunity to weigh in briefly. Um, as I mentioned, at the last meeting, I didn't think revisiting this topic was appropriate. I think the direction that was provided to staff was to come back with clarifications to the existing policy to codify any ambiguity. This document doesn't do that. 
um, what it does is it seeks to amend the existing arrangement that that this council's already litigated once during this term and has provided yet another, basically a, 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 new, a new policy, a complete separate distinct um, path forward. So I'm all for evaluating that and having that conversation, um, but it has to follow appropriate protocol. There has to be discussion with information, financial due diligence, and so forth. So while I feel comfortable speaking about the reality that forcing our utility to buy power for a more expensive price from an individual homeowner with the financial wherewithal to decouple from the town and force the town's utility to buy that power at a higher price than they could avail of the private market is economically unjustified. And every time we do that, we're taking dollars out of the utility, which is taking dollars out of the taxpayers' pockets. That's just math. Um, this is has nothing to do with being a climate emergency, has nothing to do with the merits of solar power, has nothing to do with the, the virtuous nature of people who want to seek using you know, a more appropriate forms of next generation power and cleaner energy. This is simply a fiduciary duty to make sure that our responsibilities to maintain, to have our, our town owned utility avail themselves of the lowest possible source of power. Like that's all this is about. And if we, if the lowest source of power is that falls within our environmental mandate um, can be procured off the grid. We, we've already made a number of strategic decisions to move forward in that way. And I think this is completely um, polar opposite strategy to the one we've already uh, accepted. So, you know, I can't accept it on the, on the logic of, of um, you know, this just this is just off strategy for the utility, and it's off set if it's off strategy with the solar garden, and it's it's just it's off sat it's off strategy on on area, and it's off strategy on buying from Nelcor, it's off strategy with buying from MB Power. I mean, so we've made numbers, of, we've made a dozen decisions in the last four years, and and a decision to reverse course now. Um, at the last council meeting of the, the mandate for something that, by the way, nobody on council asked for, not even sure how it showed up on the agenda. Certainly wasn't anything I can recall anyone putting in a request to council to prepare for us. Um, so I'll be, I, I can't support the motion, but I do believe that the motion is well intended. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just have to clarify the last part about where this came from and what's being presented. Um, so, you know, again, without getting into the substance of it, uh, Councillor Feeney, this was presented here because staff are being asked to apply a policy that does not provide clarity in its application. Well, we've had a question from a resident and That's right, we do right. need clarity. So we've presented two options, one of which clarifies the current practice, but makes that practice policy. And yes. the other one, it, it does represent a change. And the reason yes. we presented an alternative there is because when we scanned the other jurisdictions, we did find that, you know, a, a, it is distinct what Mahombe has been doing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand it is absolutely, I agree with you, supportive right. of our, our overall strategy, but it is also something that is different from what Anaganish and Berwick are doing. And so we felt it was appropriate for council right. to decide on that basis and Obviously, either decision um, staff will apply going forward. Right. So I, I do. So I, I think we're all on the same page. The the clause five B in the existing arrangement. Um, I think that is an improvement and a clar clarification of the existing policy, and that's what was discussed at the last meeting. Um, updated October thirteenth um, element is a is a brand new. 180 degree polar opposite policy statement. I'm, I'm unaware of anyone in council who's asked for that. 
and I'm not aware of why we're why 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 it's here. The and, other way around. The uh, the October thirteenth is the is the one that was requested, which clarifies the current practice of not crediting forward. And was that not discussed at the last council meeting? And was not direction provided by council at that time? That the direction was to present it on this agenda, but we can't approve a policy at the meeting which it was provided. And also there was no motion at the last meeting. It was just staff were asked to include this wording on this agenda for council's decision. If I could, the motion that Councillor O'Neill has made is diametrically opposed as Councillor Feeney has suggested what you understood the council had originally considered, but is the complete opposite to what's that what's her motion, Councillor O'Neill's motion, would bring the town in line with, with uh, Berwick and with Anaganish. But if we continue to pursue Councillor perspective then we'll continue to fly in the face of Annie Ganesh and Berwick and the arrangement that they have. What's the difference in the price we pay for electricity from someone who is putting power into the grid versus what we sell it for? So we don't actually pay anyone and then the policy does prohibit us from paying anyone. But if we had a month where rather than a credit from a previous month, the homeowner had to purchase energy, then they'd be purchasing it at, at the general rate that you would normally pay. Um, so, you know, if, if, to avoid that cost by bringing the credit forward, um, you know, we are, we are then being, I, I can't, we're never compensating the individual. I, I don't want to suggest that we're compensating the individual. There's a, a purchase of power that has to take place to offset the power that is now being credited. And so, you know, in that month where the individual has to purchase power at our going rate, um, you know, we, we are no longer then providing power from the prior month uh, that we didn't pay for. Um, so, so we are now buying that power at our prevailing rate from NB Power if it's 2021. Um, I, I don't know if that properly answers your question. It's more of an avoided cost. I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for what we are selling power. What the, the dollar value rate. is for the difference. Like right, how many homes in the town right now have got solar panel installed? Three. Three. Mm -hmm. What happens when it's 30? Or 50. Or 50. Which is the basis of the of area's financial assessment. All of us have reviewed that around justifying the solar garden. And is it the numbers in Berwick and Andy Ganesh that makes it doable for them, but not for us? Uh, I numbers of users? Numbers. It's, it's bad I would policy. suggest that the it's numbers are. <laughs> yeah, I, I think when, when they took on the policy, there was in all three cases a choice that was made um like like Councillor Feeney has said I wasn't here for the conversations and I apologize if council was very definitive in this but just simply didn't reflect it clear, clearly in the policy of it staff are working with the okay. policy we don't have any way to know what council's discussions were um but Berwick and Anaganish you know their, their practice most closely mirrors what you see in other jurisdictions where um somebody's goal is to offset their their uh, their power usage. So, you know, they, they design their home system on that basis, attempt to adequately estimate their power usage. And they usually want to do it in a way that comes down right on the average so that they're not overproducing consistently every month. They're also not underproducing consistently every month. So our system dynamic would suggest that you only build the solar scale that would you know, allow you to be guaranteed to never overproduce. And, you know, I think it's just a question of what installers are looking at, you know, when they, when they come around to your home and what they're promoting and what people want, which is generally to offset their home usage. So, you know, if people are conscious of our policy being distinct, and I think this clarity would bring that um, for a solar installer, for a homeowner, uh, they can design their systems on that basis so that they're not spilling excess onto the grid. 
Um, but I, but I think that, you know, it, the typical design is to your average usage, uh, swinging back and forth and taking advantage of that credit, whether that's a, a credit or whether in some jurisdictions there is compensation. And originally council had determined that there would not be a credit if I counsel for you, that's what you're, but yeah. there needs to be some clarification for staff because there are cases mm. where the policy that council has approved is not clear. Council for you? <clears throat> right, and <clears throat> Mayor, when this item, which was well litigated two and a half years ago, was discussed, the reason why council, to, you know, to clarify why council took that, took that um, path was there is a recognition that that program does exist for Nova, in Nova Scotia power regions. It exists and, you know, customers avail of it all the time. Um, in our circumstance with a negative cash flow utility that doesn't make any rate of return, let alone a regulated rate of return. Um, and with strategies that we're going to unfold, which we're going to try to unlock lower average unit, like consumption prices, MB Power deal, Nalcor buy off the grid deal, solar garden deal. Um, our plan had those idea had those ideas in mind. So the question fundamentally came: Why would we buy? Why would we lock ourselves into a purchasing power from wherever, whoever, that would be higher than we could buy off the street? Why would you buy a five dollar gallon of milk? Yep. Why would you buy a three dollar gallon of milk? Why would you pay a dollar twenty five a liter for gas when you can buy the same get gallon liter of gas for a dollar? And and that was really the thinking. It has nothing to do with environmental sustainability because we're buying, as Councillor O'Neill already said, we're already buying far in excess of our obligations uh, for for green sourced power. This is really around. This is re and, and really. The other question is that, that I think we've all kind of gotten around, do we have a moral obligation to financially support people that have their own personal financial wherewithal that they can put, you know, 10 and 20, $30,000 rooftop solar systems at the expense of other citizens that are on fixed incomes, which will be notionally forced to pay more power because, they're, because our overall power costs for the utility go up. That just never made any sense to me. Thank you. Councillor O'Neill, you were made the original motion. Would you like to comment? There's an awful lot to unpack there. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just bite at some of the edges. Um, so this is, uh, I, I guess one of the first things I'd say is one reason to buy um, you know, $4 milk uh, would be if that milk is produced locally and you want to um, buy it from your neighbors and you want to essentially shop local, you may want to pay a little bit more for whatever it is uh, that you're buying. That might be something you'd want to do. Um, I do shop local and um, I like to know, I, you know, I would love to live in a community where I am buying power from my neighbors and that we uh, are all contributing toward the resilience uh, that is Mahone Bay. So that's one reason. Um, um, and I think that I would just like to say that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on here and it, it, it's not just math. I think that, um, I think that the way that the doubling down of this, um, of this policy wording, um, one of the implications is that we're, we're really actively discouraging middle-class people from putting solar installations on the roof. That's an actual intention of this. So we, and you know, and, and Councillor Feeney is nodding, he would agree that the intention of, mm. um, of preventing people from participating um, in this way in their own homes um, it, it is, so, is so that they're, they're, they can't afford to put solar on their roof. But what will happen, and, and, and the CAO has described this, is that when a solar installator in, installer comes around, they're going to take in all of the variables and maybe instead of putting in a two kilowatt system or, or slightly larger uh, on their rooftop, what they, what they will do is they'll take a look and say, okay, well, um, you should be putting in a system for June, July, and August, and that is a smaller system. And then they lock, they lock in, the house locks into that. And what, what, 
the problem, one of the problems with that is, is that that is a moment in time. That is, that is a decision, a, a long-term decision being made uh, with today's numbers. Um, and what you actually have, so today's numbers are the, the price of solar installations. It's very expensive. Um, so that this strategy will work. It will, it will prohibit residents of Mahone Bay from putting solar panels on the roof. That will be a very successful strategy because middle-class people can't afford to do it. Only very wealthy people can afford to do it. Okay, so then, um, so then, but what will happen is the price of solar is going down year after year after year after year after year. And where that person probably should have put a much larger uh, system on their house um, that could factor into some potential uh, um, uh, strategy for area and for Mahome Bay Solar Garden, it will actually uh, freeze that decision uh, in 2020, right? So, so it actually is preventing residents of Mahome Bay from uh, an opportunity to be part of the distributed energy system of the future. So I just want to leave that there. That's one of those unintended consequences when, when you actually make a decision for a moment in time um, and double down on a regressive approach um, that is one of the very likely possible implications of mm -hmm. making that kind of a decision. <clears throat> Meryl, one last brief comment on the topic. Like, as, as far as I'm concerned, like I believe council to collectively in a seven to zero vote voted in support of proceeding with applications to the federal provincial government to support a community solar garden. I believe everybody on council voted for that. The fundamental core prevailing pillar of that strategy was to offset individual installations of solar panels on roofs. Like that way, it wasn't financial. It was $23,000 a year of net savings to the utility on the back of a $6 million investment. It would, you know, it was really, it was around how can we all collectively together benefit? So yes, this is absolutely, it, this is all it is. We're trying to do something together as a community. And if for every one person who goes their own way and does their own thing, fair enough. Like, as I expressed in the last meeting, no one's stopping anyone from putting a solar panel on the roof. If, if, if you, you know, altruistically want to go do that, great. But, you know, the person living on a fixed income down the road doesn't need to financially compensate you for that. You're on your own if you go do that. Now, as a town, we've got a big, big project in the solar garden, and it's premised on ma making sure that people have another alternative. And we've all been through two or three briefings. I think we had one just a few days ago. So fundamentally, this does it. To, to me, this just comes down to follow the strategy that we've all agreed upon. This amendment is not following that original strategy. And, and, and that's, that's all it is. Just, you can't have all, you can't be all things to all people. Um, in this case, we're on the solar garden path. And, and until the government tells us we're not getting the money, then maybe this will get back on the agenda. But as long as that is the plan, that's the plan. Anyone else wish to comment, Councillor Kerber? Well, uh, well, I'm. Uh, I don't see it as an all or nothing, or all one way or all the other way. Uh, I think we can have both, and I, I, I don't like the idea of um, forcing people who have installed uh, their own solar systems. Um, into a box. I, I find that objectionable. I would rather have a system where people have choices. And we, we've we talked about the fact that it, it will not likely make a huge financial difference. I may have misunderstood, but that's my understanding. And we've talked about the solar garden as an opportunity for people of all income levels to buy in to the philosophy of solar power um, and which is one reason why people put it on their roofs too they believe in the philosophy as well as in the the finances but i i don't i think we can have both i don't think it has to be all or nothing
Okay, we have a request for a recorded vote. Uh, Town Clerk, would you read the motion, please? Certainly. Motion by Councillor O'Neill, seconded by Councillor Carver. The Council amend the solar connectivity policy so that excess power generated will be credited toward usage in a future period. Let's begin, Councillor Bain. Negative. Councillor Carver. Uh, pro, four, yes. Two, Councillor Feeney. Uh, I'm a nay, Mayor. Deputy Mayor Noss. Hey. Councillor Now. Hey. Yeah. Councillor O'Neill. Yes. Yes. M and A as well. So by a vote of five to two, the motion is defeated. So, Mr. CAO, are you comfortable that the clarification to staff is now agreed um, upon? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm hoping Councillor Feeney will jump in and make a motion to amend the policy with the other wording that was presented. And then if, okay. if that were approved, and, and sorry to Joe to put you on the spot, it could be anyone, but you did speak eloquently in favor. Um, and then when we have that, then we would be in a position to say we had clarity. And Councillor Feeney, um, when you do your motion, do you want a recorded vote? Uh, or is that no, necessary? No, 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 Mayor, I believe, uh, I believe the will of council has been you yeah, know, already expressed okay. on, a no, on a number of occasions over a number of years. Um, but I do believe that um, the CAO's request for some clarification will, will help staff um, talk about the issue with, with uh, people in the community. Um, so um, I do think that this will help staff uh, with the clarity and therefore I'm pleased to move it forward. Uh, and I'd move that staff uh, provide the amendment to the attached solar um, connectivity policy issue. Um, and that would be that there will be no compensation to the customer from the utility for any excess power generated by the customer. Excess power generated in a given period uh, will not be credited uh, towards the use in future periods. I'll second the motion. I just uh, wanted to say really briefly that I thought it was uh, great to have a council here where we're able to debate the best way to move forward with renewable energy and where everybody around the table is pursuing that common goal. And we're just looking at the policy solutions that will get us there most effectively as a community. So, you know, that's, I think it's a pretty great discussion to be able to have with the council. I just want to thank everybody for engaging in all the pros and cons in this way in a, in a manner that our residents can, can look on. I think the sum total of this council's support for the notion over the last two years, the whole climate change, the approach to energy and the energy alternatives that this council, the outgoing council, certainly should give itself a pat on the back for a job well done that other municipalities can take as an example. Okay. May I speak to that, Mayor? Yes, you may. I'm, I, I don't have many uh, opportunities beyond this evening to, uh, to speak to this council on, on this topic. So I just thought I'd jump in and, um, uh, with my agreement uh, fully to what you've just said, I think that this council has an awful lot to be proud of. We do the hard work. We have lots of conversations, and um, and I think that every single but every single person on this council is trying to do uh, the best that they can to um, to um, progress uh, the the town of Mahombe utility and address the climate crisis. And you know we don't always uh, line up on the same side. Uh, of these arguments, but uh, I just wanted to say how much I've enjoyed uh, the conversation with everyone and, and the respect that I have for everybody on this council. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. On that note, we'll have the vote. All in favor? Opposed? 
Okay, the motion is passed. Thank you very much. Good discussion. Okay, let's go to the next item on the agenda, which is the staff report on trees and parks. All right, I'm just uh, bringing this up on the screen, but while I'm doing that, I just wanted to say that this um, report is an attempt to address a number of motions that Council put forward. Uh, they aren't necessarily all entirely related or exactly related, so I hope everybody would um, forgive me and, and maybe understand in reading this why I wanted to address them together. Um, but I think it's important that we kind of see the interconnectedness of the different issues. Um, that does mean that at the end, this report boils down to a recommendation that may seem reductive given all the things that have been uh, put forward here. And I guess, you know, I'll just preface that by saying that I believe that that is an important step um, in the right direction, along with actions council has already taken, such as the plan review. Uh, but certainly there are a number of different items that are discussed in this report that you may feel are not fully reflected in the motion here and, and could be revisited in budget or otherwise. Um, but uh, I do have the motion that I'm recommending up on the screen here. I'm happy to take any questions. Councillor Carver. You're on mute, Councillor Carver. Yes, I have trouble finding the the button. Um, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate this uh, omnibus bill that staff have brought forward because it, it covers a huge it covers a huge amount and expresses the value of the town's natural assets uh, in a very tangible way. Um, I'm very happy to make this motion. Um, and I also have a question um, about the, uh, the nature of the training that was mentioned in the body of the report. And um, specifically, I have a question about how that training will be implemented. Um, mm -hmm. it's, when I looked at it, it's, it's very, very comprehensive. Um, and I really would like to see some detail in how that training would be actually operationalized for our staff. So if we, if we could just have a bit of feedback from staff on that um, before going to the motion. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, so as far as the training goes, I mean, obviously it's two part as outlined there is to, to attempt to build capacity within our staff, but then also to acknowledge the need to rely on contractors to maintain a, you know, a, an essentially a base level of, of expertise that is not something that realistically we could have the capacity for on staff. And so um, there will be projects on which we will acknowledge the need to bring in an arborist and hopefully on an annual basis, we'll be able to flag areas where we know that safe vegetation maintenance is expected with the utility, which we usually do know which areas of town are likely to be done in the coming year and have a contract arborist to come in and take a look at that um, along with our staff. But between those occasions, when we have the opportunity to have contracted resources on, um, there is that sort of level of, of competence within our staff. Um, there are a lot of you know, written materials specific to that ANSI A300 standard. Um, we, we do need to make those manuals available to staff. Uh, but I think that there are also some opportunities with, you know, the same arborist contractors that we would we would rely on to provide field training to help supplement that. So uh, I think that my my hope would be um, by contracting uh, with one of the large providers, you know, not to name names, but it's folks like Asplund, which are you know big international companies. Um, that we can identify, you know, practical uh, way to get that training onboarded to our field staff. I think it's important to acknowledge the breadth of responsibility and the relatively small crew that we have. So we're not sending people away for, um, you know, weeks at a time or hiring someone new to, to bring, bring this onto our team. Although obviously we'll look for that in hiring decisions down the road. Um, so that's my thought is that we'll, we'll look for opportunities with the, contractor that we identify 
um, to do field training and to kind of get our, our staff um, up to that level, uh, supplementing the purchase of materials. Thank you. Uh, and while, while I appreciate the, the value of the, free, the um, field training um, and the episodic nature of that uh, opportunity, uh, I am concerned that there is not a proactive uh, approach to ensuring that our staff who are managing the trees and uh, green resources without some something more than reading a manual. Um, several years ago, there was a, an initiative planned on the part of the town of, of Bridgewater to jointly provide training to uh, municipal staff from all the units in the area. And I wonder if that idea could be pursued. So that, it, so that, that but rather than being left by chance, there is a very definite proactive pro approach. Yeah, well, we'll certainly be on the lookout for those opportunities. And I can follow up specifically with Bridgewater. Um, you know, I think we're always looking at that with our with our fellow units here. So whether it's on um, uh, fall prevention or traffic signing or anything else, um, you know, we try to combine the training. So uh, yeah, if there's anything we can find from Bridgewater, we'll, we'll look into that for sure. I may have to at some some point come back with a motion, um, but at the moment I'll I'll, um, I'll go with what we have here. Uh, that I move that council direct staff to prepare a proposal for the FCM's municipal asset management program for data collection and the development of management plans for the town's natural assets to be presented for council's consideration no later than January 2021. Other comments? I'll second it, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Feeney, are you going to? Well, I think that I'm just there's a sec. Is this there are two motions today, uh, Councillor Carr? Motion that's in the text. Uh, the to signage one it. probably discreet. I, yeah. I see them as separate, so I'm only making the first one. Fair enough. I just want to check the. Uh, can we put that the motion back up, please? See where you are. Yes, 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 yes. I had the same concern when I read this, and it it's in a number of different locations throughout the text of the article or the the response that was provided. Um, you know, it talks about that our town consists of about 768 acres of land, 1.2 square miles of the 7.6 acre or the, the 768 acres, 5.2% are owned by the town. That's either forest or parkland or cemeteries and some naturalized woodland as well. When I read through this, I see references to trimming town trees, natural assets in our asset database. It talks a lot about assets in the town, trees in the town, forest in the town. I think it needs to specify town owned property, not trees in the town, because that alludes to the trees that are on private property. This is an issue for town-owned property, not private property. Certainly educate the homeowner, educate the property owner about uh, trees and, and, and how to deal with issues and arborists have trees inspected. But as a former councillor once in Washington, we're surrounded by trees on three sides in Mahon Bay. To start preventing property owners from dealing with their own property would be a travesty. And the way this is worded 
It does not specify town-owned property or town-owned trees. It talks about town, town trees. Well, I've got trees in the town. Deputy Mayor's got trees in the town. We all have trees in the town. But this policy or this program should be relevant to the trees that the town owns, that 5.2 acres of woodland and cemetery and whatever. I would suggest an amendment to this motion so that it talks about for the, the towns, the town owned natural assets. Natural assets, but it be town owned. I can't make that motion, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The amendment, but someone else can. And uh, that certainly was the intent of the recommendation with the capital T there, but somebody could find that lacking in clarity. So um, certainly that wouldn't wouldn't change the intent of the motion. No, it would not. I I would um, re reframe the motion to say management plans plans for the for town owned natural assets. I agree. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carver. The seconder agrees. Yep. Okay, Council, the motion then that Council directs staff to prepare a proposal for the FCM Municipal Asset Management Program for data collection and the development of management plans for the town owned natural assets to be presented for Council's consideration no later than January 2021. All in favor? I can't see all the hands, but anyone <laughs> opposed? <laughs> good. Yes, okay. Thank that. you. Yeah. Just a quick a question if I could. On that. What about the I, second motion? I see at the end there it says about a town of tree committee. Is that still in effect or is that going to be something that's brought back in or? Um, so the yeah. trees. The Trees Committee bylaw is a current bylaw of the town. Now, when we adopted the committee's policy, it was acknowledged that we were no longer um, using a tree committee it, mm. as defined in the bylaws it's an operational committee. So it's a it's it's part of a former structure of government that no longer exists. Um, that being said, the bylaw is still on the books, and there's an expectation that we would revisit it, and at that time discuss whether the intent of the bylaw, which, you know, that they may have prescribed the mechanism of the tree committee, but the intent was regulation of uh, and maintenance of trees on both public and private land. The public land part is covered by our structure, which places that responsibility under director of operations. We've had lots of conversations about how we best use that responsibility. But the private land part is still something that you know is is not discussed, is not otherwise covered by any other town bylaw. So when we get around to a point where that bylaw could be repealed, um, council can discuss at that time if there is any intent behind it that is not adequately covered elsewhere. But the recommendation of this report was that. Um, council wait until the uh, uh, municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw review period was over um, because that would give us a better sense of whether private trees were uh, adequately protected by the provisions of those bylaws or required additional regulation. And, uh, and I think that is a good subject that will be discussed, the trade-offs where you're looking at infill versus sprawl, protection of the urban tree canopy versus the natural woodlands. Um, so there is some, some discussion within that um, plan process. And then after that, uh, yes, council will need to take a look at that um, trees committee bylaw for, for repeal or revision. Thank you. And I noticed in the tree committee bylaw that uh, the town can go on private property and spray trees required. That's how outdated I think that whole mm. notion is. Mm. I was just advised that my volume is, there's a, still a problem with it. Mm. It's something on uh, on this laptop. I don't know what it might be, but I and have it. 
refer to the IT people. Well, Mary, you've got four years to get it fixed. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I haven't stopped sharing the screen because as was pointed out, uh, I think Councillor Feeney had asked about mm. there was a second recommended motion here just because I didn't want to forget uh, didn't fit in with the rest of the report at all. So I so I created a separate motion just to carry that forward to budget if council is so inclined. Um, so I'll just leave that there if anyone wants to make that motion. Otherwise, we'll leave it on the table. Councilor Feeney? Mayor, I'd move the council refer improved park signage to the 2021-2022 budget process for further consideration. Second that. Under, Councilor mm. now. Mayor, that was just before we vote on that, um, I, you know, I think this topic did come up at the Heritage Advisory Committee last month, and there was, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of committee support for um, improved signage, especially around the aquatic gardens um, and that area interpretation. And uh, I know we've got a, a deferred beautification initiative, um, which can get recrafted next year. So uh, hopefully this will uh, augment what we've already kind of got in our uh, in our priority list on, under that program. I was at a, a middle service at the park cemetery and uh, a person fell and was injured. And we called 911 and it took eight minutes to explain to the person on the phone where the park cemetery was. Hmm. Because there's no sign with a, a road number, if you will, down on Kinburn. A really difficult, you know, the person is sitting there, laying there with a, a broken arm as it turned out, and they're trying to get the ambulance to deal with it, and rather elderly, and they didn't have a street number. So it's, I hope, as part of this new wayfinding signing, look at issues as minor and seemingly as that's the way to the cemetery. But in fact, this person waited for medical help. Mm. Anyway, we have a motion on the floor. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Motion's carried. Okay. Let's go on to the next item. PAO, can you enlighten me? I can't see it on my iPad here. Next agenda item, there we go. Age friend, oh, COVID-19, <laughs> nothing going on there with COVID-19. There's nothing, I don't think that I can add other than um, what you're seeing in the news, the situation in, in uh, Quebec, Ontario, BC, now in New Brunswick, the, the potential or the consideration for reducing the size of the um, Atlantic bubble. The, at the chamber chat tonight, first one that they've had since March, they did talk about the impact of COVID on businesses in the town. And the suggestion was the, the B and B's in particular, those dealing with the accommodation side of it have been adversely affected because most of the business we've been seeing during the summer season have been day trippers. 80% of them from around Nova Scotia and most of them from Metro, which is great for the vendors and the eateries, but not so much for the B&B. They're, um, they're looking at ways of keeping that momentum going, not the least of which is the upcoming Christmas festival. More about that to come. Okay. Councillor Carver, Age Friendly Community Committee. You've got the report. Are there any questions from the draft minutes? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was just going to add something to the COVID uh, situation in relation to the chamber. Uh, I thought there, the statistics that they reported for the visitors at the Visitor Information Center were astonishing. They had um, 2,800 visitors, yeah. the vast majority of whom were from Nova Scotia, 
but in by comparison, the Visitor Information Center in Blockhouse had um, close to a thousand, and also the same same in Lunenburg Town, um, the Blockhouse Hill. In fact, they they moved their visitor inform information resources down to the um, the museum in Lunenburg. So. Uh, uh, the, the chamber did a phenomenal job in keeping the visitor information center open this year and uh, being and welcoming visitors. So that really augured well, I think, for activity in the town. Yes. So the age friendly community committee. I don't have really anything uh, to say other than that we had a really good conversation with uh, Jason for the Plan the Home Bay project. Um, people really va appreciated that opportunity to provide that input. Um, right. Mr. Hyde, the agenda, please. Let's go to the asset uh, management committee's draft minutes. And I'm just not entirely sure because I can never know between Teams and Zoom. Are you seeing the committee minutes now or the agenda? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm actually was... seeing the proposed motion. Yes. For council. So, sorry if I got a little disjointed there when I was loading up the different minutes then. I, I wasn't sure if everybody saw them all flipping back and forth on the screen. So apologies for that. Um, yeah, I loaded this one up. Just wanted to highlight the motion since I think this may be the first time the asset management committee had provided a motion. So for... Um, this is an unusual one because the mayor is the chair of that committee and the mayor is not usually making a motion here. So um, perhaps Richard as the other member of council, if you want. Please to make that motion. So I'll move that council approve the draft asset management posters and fact sheets developed by the committee for the public distribution. Seconder. Did somebody second it? I'll second it. <clears throat> I think John did. Uh -huh. Sorry, I've still got oh, the minutes okay. up on the screen. Okay, Councillor Feeney. Mayor, just um, so I'm not sure if this uh, if this really needed a motion or not, but I'm I'm happy to support it. But I would like to provide staff with as much flexibility as they need as these posters get micro edited, and you know suggestions come in to make further improvements to them. Um, when we get some feedback from the community. Like, I think these posters really uh, would be viewed as living, living documents that will evolve mm -hmm. and change over time. So when I think when we when we say we're approving it, we're not approving it so that it's never going to be altered. We're just sort of approving it to say, amazing job. I'm glad these are introduced. But, you know, I certainly wouldn't want Maureen to have to come back to council to ask for an I to get dotted or a T to get crossed. So that was the only I think we're all on the same page, right? I think it's an important yeah. point because there were already a few suggestions given by members yeah. of council on seeing these uh, come out and especially with the fact sheets and, and they are intended to be uh, uh, living documents, like you say, um, but also the committee to check in, especially at this point where um, we are at the end of, of a term with committee members and to sort of show council the work that's been done to date and indicate that we are going to be using this work um, to put some stuff out into the public now, but we will continue to improve them going forward, of course. We did have quite a protracted discussion at the meeting about the, the posters, the fonts that are being used, uh, the colors of lettering versus the background coloring, and the authors of same and staff had committed to, to do the research or to talk to whoever they need to talk to, make the necessary changes to make those posters as compatible with as many people as can be. Those yeah, I wanted to make sure we had the um, agreement on like the wording in general, at least to we yeah. the point where now it is not going to be a constant back and forth. So they'll do a review of the size and font on them now and then they can make sure that whatever they select, we've got the wording and, and then we're good to go. So yes, you're right. Council the committee did get a little book to put the caveat pages. in there. Councilor Carver. Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask uh, staff do, if whether or not we have a policy or guideline 
uh, written or accepted about following uh, accessible accessible guidelines, accessibility guidelines in our communications. I guess I don't. was just. <laughs> I can just say we don't, uh, Councillor Carver. Um, you know, right now the province has left us in this position as municipalities of doing our best. Um, they've indicated that there will be standards forthcoming, and one of those areas is print and digital media. Um, that there will be standards forthcoming. In the absence of those standards, uh, municipalities have been sharing best practices and doing our best to identify what we can do. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there will always be um, some argument that a different approach might have served some people better. And until there is a standard that we can peg it to, I think we will be a, a moving target of just doing our best um, based on what we know. So any any examples, obviously, though, are great. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm feeling curmudgeonly tonight. At that being said, I was disappointed to see again um, the 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 white font on pale backgrounds when it's been discussed several times before. Well, we've just asked them to hold off on that change because I didn't want to push too much with changing it while we were in progress. So now that all of them have come to council, we're going to ask all of them to have that oversight. So that's why you haven't seen that change yet. It's not that it hasn't been noted, it was in the minutes. Right. The, the, what I'm disappointed is that it, <clears throat> even though we've discussed it several times before, the, the, the material was presented like that. I will rest my point now. Okay, anything else? All right. Let's go on to the MJSB draft minutes of August. We're, we're in discussion 6th. on the, I think we're still in discussion on that motion. Which one? I'm accepting of the posters. Oh. I'm sorry, you're right. We haven't voted. Pardon me? We haven't voted on the poster motion. No, yet. We, we have a motion on the floor, though, don't we? Carried away with these discussions. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Picking that one up. So let's go on to the MJSB draft minutes. Comments or questions? SB. <clears throat> Mayor, I think um, just to acknowledge that uh, that was Sue, uh, Sue's last meeting and um, the, the uh, members of uh, Joint Services Board were, uh, you know, were in a position to uh, wish Sue well for all her hard work. And, you know, many councils around the table have had the opportunity over the last you know, uh, 10 years or so to work with Sue. And uh, it's been an amazing transformation, even in the last four years, uh, and a, in large part due to her leadership. And uh, she'll really be missed. I'm sure, I know you and, and some of the other uh, councillors and mayors are, are working on her replacement, but that's going to be a tough job because she did an incredible job. She was an incredible resource and very, it's going to be very difficult to replace someone of that kind of talent. Have two candidates left in the process to uh, select for her replacement and actually tomorrow morning there are face-to-face -face interviews dates and the selection board members in Bridgewater so we're we're getting closer only for our candidates to mm -hmm. There is an MJSB meeting, I think, tomorrow night. Yes, yeah, a special meeting. Okay, Just for a moment. let's go on. No cupcake. To uh, Lunenburg County Senior Safety Program Report. Yes, as, you, as usual, the, uh, the report is there about the activities of, of the, um, the program. Uh, during the previous month, so that was September. Um, they're still carrying a, a big uh, caseload and Mahone Bay is still re well represented there in terms of the, the numbers of clients that they're seeing. The, uh, unless there's any questions about the report, um, I just wanna make one other bit of information available, a bit of information available. Any questions about the report? 
Nope. Well, um, the public library has uh, received funding from the United Way to do it, uh, what, what has been called in the past a telephone assurance program. Um, it's called Caring Calls. So uh, they have hired a really terrific person um, to reach out to seniors. So they're receiving names and numbers of people who would be willing to receive caring calls. It's a way of trying to address social isolation amongst seniors. And um, I think it's a really, really good program and very much needed. So if there's anybody that you come across um, who might benefit from that particular kind of call, their new hire, Marilyn, has just a way with her. And I know, and I'll tell you how I know, is because um, I received a call from Marilyn and I said, why are you calling me? And I, I mean, I'm a senior, clearly. Um, but she said, we're going through our records and checking our birth dates. We're, we're doing it on the basis of birth dates. But I had the personal experience of her approach and she was really, was really, really nice. So, I can send I can send you the poster by email tomorrow. Okay. I think that is the end of our regular agenda. We do have an in camera agenda. Would you like to do we have any questions from the public, uh, Kurt? No, there are no questions from the public. Before the public leaves us, I would like to publicly recognize that Councillor O'Neill, Councillor Bain, and Deputy Mayor Noss will not be back for our new council in November. They have, as they say, done yeoman service, or would it be yo person service, <laughs> and contributed much to the success of this council. And I personally would like to thank all of you who will not be returning for making my job easier. I do hope that continues in November. <laughs> but thank you very much. And with that, I would entertain a motion to go in camera. So moved. So moved. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Noss. CAO, are we going to stay here or go to? I think uh, we can just get Kelly's verification when the uh, YouTube has been okay. closed down and then we should be okay to stay here this time. Okay. <clears throat> just give me.